Welcome back class. Today we're going to continue uh, looking at the Reformation, specifically at Martin Luther. Uh, what I'm going to want you guys to do is take notes in Cornell style notes. So here I've kind of drew a poorly drawn outline of what a sheet of paper looks like. At the top of that paper, you're going to write Martin Luther because that's who these notes are on. Then you're going to draw a line all the way down. Your notes are probably going to take two pages. So the first side, you're going to take this line and draw it all the way down. And then you're going to number it. We're going to go over four things. Number one will be challenge the church. Now don't, I'm going to tell you when we're going forward. So right now, write just number one. Okay. And then on the other side of that line, as we go through the PowerPoint, you'll take your notes. And then when you finish, I'll tell you that we're moving to number two which is the 95 Theses, on the other side of that line, we'll take notes until we get to number four, which is the response. Um, and at that point, you'll probably be on the second page of your notes. When you get to the end, you're going to draw a line across, and you're going to answer the constructor response question, which will be posted uh, in complete sentences, um, which will be posted within the PowerPoint. All right, so today we are going to look at Martin Luther. Now, the thing that is fascinating about Martin Luther is that, well, in a way, he's kind of crazy um, because he does what not a lot of people would have done, uh, but also that he's able to find one thing he doesn't like and come up with 95 things that is wrong with it. 95 different things that he took issue with. And so Martin Luther ends up challenging the church. This is that number one challenge the church that I was talking about in your Cornell notes. So a little bit about Martin Luther. His parents wanted him to be a lawyer, make that money. Uh, instead, he becomes a monk and a teacher, and I can tell you from personal experience, he is not making that money that he would have made as a lawyer. But instead, he becomes a, a teacher of religion at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. Um, he teaches scripture, um, and, and he becomes very knowledgeable on the Bible and Christianity. Um, it is from his knowledge of the Bible and Christianity that he's able to come up with these 95 theses. And his 95 theses are what begins the Reformation. It is what starts the reforming and the changing of the Catholic Church. Now, in a previous video, we talked about the causes of the Reformation. Martin Luther is able to begin the Reformation. These are all the, the causes are all the things that were going on. Uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther just takes those causes, finds 95 reasons that the church needs to be changed, and starts the Reformation. So if I ask you what started the Reformation, it is the 95 Theses. If I ask you who started the Reformation, it is Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther believed things that the church said were not allowed. He believed it was okay for the clergy to marry, so he himself did that. He was a firm believer in practicing what he teached. Um, and so he gets married, um, and this is where his disagreements with religion and, and the Bible, or what's being taught in religion and what, what's being taught and his viewpoints on the Bible start to start to change, start to alter. And so this is where we're going to get into number two in your Cornell notes, the 95 theses themselves. Martin Luther takes a stand, and he takes a stand against a man by the name of Johann Tetzel, who was selling indulgences, and he's selling indulgences throughout uh, Europe, but Martin Luther finds out that the money from these indulgences are going to the rebuilding of the St. Petersburg, or the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, and Martin Luther takes issue with not only the indulgences themselves, but where the money is going towards and indulgences, which is one of your vocabulary words, you should know what this means, is a pardon or, or uh, which releases a, a sinner from 
penalty for his for his sins. Um, and it releases a sinner from the penalty that a priest may impose on that person for their sins. And so it essentially allowed people to buy forgiveness. They would give money to the church and the church would say, you're forgiven. And so people are paying literally for their sin. And, and Luther just says, no, that's not right. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what should be taught. But people at this time don't know any better. They, they're not able to read for themselves. And, and, and the church is telling them and they're taking the church for, for what they say. And Martin Luther starts to point out, no, that's not what it says. No, that's not right. And this is just step one in finding 95 things that he believes the church is doing wrong. And so indulgences were not supposed to affect God's right to judge. And this is this is what Martin Luther keeps preaching. And, and the, the church can't do this. The church can't sell indulgences. The church can't uh, forgive your forgive your sins. That's not how this works. And you can't buy forgiveness. And so. People start listening to Martin Luther and wonder, wondering why what he's saying and what their churches are telling them are different. And so Tetzel is giving people the impression and people are, are believing that they're buying their way into heaven and that they can use this money to ensure that when they die, they're going to heaven. And, and Martin Luther's like, no, that's not how that works. October 31st, Halloween, ironically, um, Martin Luther loses his mind. Martin Luther goes crazy, absolutely bananas. Martin Luther writes a list, writes it out. And I challenge you to do this. I challenge you to find something that you dislike so much that you can find 95 different things that are wrong with it. I, I've tried. It's Difficult. It's very, very difficult. But Martin Luther writes out his 95 theses and it is on like parchment paper and it's just long lists and it just rolls out. And he goes to one of the largest uh, churches right outside the castle in Germany. And he goes to the front door, right in the middle of mass, right for, for just right in the middle of the teaching. For those of you that go to church, imagine the pastor is just up there and he's right in the middle of the sermon and he's getting into it. And he's getting right to the good part. And then all of a sudden, he takes a hammer and a nail and proceeds to beat. I just broke something. Proceeds to beat. Into the wall. Be literally knock this list into the wall. And um, this is how I know that he must have, have been at a predominantly white church. Because as people were beating on the door, or as he was beating with a hammer and a nail into the front door, people were like, what is going on over there? That's how people get murdered. This is why, this is why people were too curious. White people are too curious. But he goes, and people are like, oh my gosh, there's someone beating on the door. Let me go check it out. Obviously, he's not there by the time he's, he's gone. He's left. He beat on the door. He leaves. People come out, and they start reading. And they're reading the 95 different things that Martin Luther has pointed out is wrong with the church. And all of a sudden, people start to question, who's right? Is it this man who is a teacher of scripture? Or is it their church? The 95 Theses, these are all formal statements. They're attacking who, what he calls pardon merchants. Uh, essentially, it's just 95 different statements of things that are wrong with the church and things that the Catholic Church is doing wrong and the, the people that they have in charge. And these 95 theses, again, begin the Reformation. His 95 theses start the Reformation. But what's crazy is, is that this is not the beginning of when Martin Luther goes absolutely bananas 
on the church. He draws a picture of the Pope and distributes it out to Europe, depicting the Pope as a satanic figure. This is where we're going to go on to step three, or part three of your Cornell notes. Luther's teaching. So Luther, as he finds these 95 things that he believes the Catholic Church is wrong about, and that their teachings are wrong and whatnot, he's got to give a, a right answer, what the right thing or the right way to do it is. And so his teachings were good works were not needed to get salvation. You, you didn't just have to be a good person. You didn't, well, I take that back. No matter the good deeds you did, it wasn't going to determine whether you got salvation or not. In fact, it was faith and faith alone that would gain this salvation for you. And he believed that the church teaching should be based on the Bible and the Bible alone, and that the Pope, church traditions, or anything of the sort should not change it. it you should. He believed that the people themselves should go and read the Bible on their own. And this is why the printing press becomes so important, because with the invention of the printing press, all of a sudden the Bible is being mass produced and people can go and read it on their own. And so he believed that the teaching should be based on the Bible and not what the Pope said or not what the church was teaching, but that this is what the Bible says. You should go home and do some research and you come up with an interpretation on your own. And this isn't necessarily what the Pope or the Catholic Church was doing at the time because they were relying on the fact that people couldn't read and they were relying on the fact that the Bible wasn't being mass produced because the printing press wasn't invented yet. And so now with people going and reading it on their own and Martin Luther pointing out the inaccuracies and telling people where to go and read, Martin Luther is starting to gain some traction and gain some, some popularity. And he believed that priests did not need to interpret the Bible because all people who had this faith were equal. And that your ability to go and read the Bible and interpret it made you just as equal as a priest. In fact, he encouraged people to go and interpret the Bible on their own. And so he starts to protest the Catholic Church. And if you look at the word Protestant, Protestant churches start to pop up all throughout France as a result of Martin Luther's teachings. And if you look at the word Protestant, it has the word protest in it. It has the word protest in it because Protestant churches are literally protesting the Catholic Church. And this is essentially your first denomination that withdraws from the Catholic Church. Now we look at the response. This is number four in your Cornelius. The response to Martin Luther. The Pope at the time threatens to excommunicate Luther. You're going to kick him out of the Catholic Church. This is uh, one of the things throughout history, maybe it's because I'm a nerd, that makes me laugh. The Pope threatens to kick this man out of the Catholic Church when he has essentially already said, I quit the Catholic Church. This whole thing is false. I don't like the way you do it. Everything you do is not right. But the Pope thinks that by threatening to kick him out of a church he has already quit, that his actions are going to change. This would be like a boss threatening to fire you after you already quit. I quit. I'm quitting today. This is it. I'm done. I quit. Oh, well, if you don't change your behavior, I'm going to fire you. What? I already quit. Threatening to fire me doesn't work. I already quit. My behavior is not going to change. But this is essentially what the Pope decides that he is going to do. He threatens to excommunicate Luther if he doesn't take back his statements. So, Martin Luther, being the semi-crazy man that he is, gets this letter that says this, I'm going to kick you out of the Catholic Church. Instead of taking his statements back, Martin Luther literally lights it on fire, burns it to ashes in front of everyone. And he believes that this actions will prove that the Pope is just a man and that everyone is equal in faith. And so he burns 
the letter and then the Pope kicks him out of the Catholic Church. He excommunicates him. Bye, I'll see you later. Adios, you're fired. Well, Luther doesn't care because Luther already quit. Charles V, who is the leader and the king of the Holy Roman Empire at the time, is Catholic. And he kind of is very close to the Pope. Him and the, him and the Pope are boys. And the Pope goes to Charles V and is like, bro, I need you to have my back. I need, you, I need you to have my back on this one. I need you to take care of this. We're boys. My problem is your problem. And so Charles V puts out essentially what we would call a warrant. He summons Martin Luther and says, you have to take back, you need to recant, take your statements back. And he issues a law that says anybody that helps Martin Luther either by feeding him or giving him a place to stay, would then also be a criminal or a convict because Martin Luther refuses. Not only does Martin Luther refuse to take his statements back, Martin Luther tells Charles V, all right, you know what, I'll show up. And Charles V tells the Pope, who's his boy, he's like, hey, hey, I got him. He's going to show up. He's going to take all his statements back. We're, gonna be, we're good. We're good. And everyone gathers. The Pope comes and Martin Luther just stands them all up. He's just like, ha, <laughs> ha. Joke's on you, I'm not coming. So it is at that point that Charles issues what is called the Eden of Orange, declaring Luther a heretic and an outlaw and a criminal and anyone who helped him as well. Good thing that Luther also has friends. Frederick the Wise uh, shelters Luther. While there, Luther translates the New Testament into German. This is a big deal because he can then, because with the printing press, he can make copies of it. See, prior to this, the New Testament wasn't translated into vernacular. It wasn't translated into the regular uh, languages of people so that they could read it. Luther sits and he translates the entire thing. And then he uses Gutenberg's invention to make large quantities and copies. And he starts to distribute the New Testament out. Um, and he returns back with a new following years later. And his followers become known as Lutherans. And all he starts to gain a following that becomes so large that the, the leaders have no choice. Leaders in these countries kind of to remain in power, have to fall in line. And so um, other princes in Germany support Luther and they band together to protest the Catholic Church. And together it all becomes known as Protestants. And Protestant churches start to pop up. Everywhere that's red starts to become Protestant. It's starting to spread out. It's starting to spread out. And the biggest result is that because of Martin Luther's actions, this is the biggest thing that comes. Christianity branches out. There becomes two Major branches of Christianity all of a sudden. You got Catholics and you got Protestants. And eventually, as you can see from the chart right here, Protestants branches out even more into some of your more common denominations. And essentially, the 95 Theses and Martin Luther's actions are why we have 742 different denominations of Christianity today. Because Martin Luther decided to stand up and say, this is not right. This is not what it says. You're going to stop lying to all these people. Now, what you guys are going to do is you're going to look at King Henry VIII of England, who also had an issue with the Catholic Church. Except instead of going about it in Martin Luther's way, in writing it all down and spreading that information, he proceeds to start killing people. You're going to do that via web quest. It should be posted on Canvas. Make sure you're checking your table of contents and that your, um, your notes are in the right places. Uh, you can reach out to me if you need any help. At the bottom of your notes today, be sure that you answer this constructive response question. 
identify the reasons that drove Martin Luther to write the 95 Theses and describe the outcome. So what were the causes or the reasons why Martin Luther wrote these 95 Theses and what were the effects? What were the outcomes? As always, you can contact me if you need any help and have a great day.